Welcome back. This is American Zarathustra, Donald Kent, the Imperium Art Show, episode 16. Today, we have an extremely important guest with us today. I would say that I cannot think of anybody who's done more for the arts in the dissident right. Ladies and gentlemen, the founder of the White Art Collective, Jeff Winston. Well, hello, Donald. Hello, Nullis. Thank you guys for having me. That's a very flattering intro. I don't know if it's completely true, but uh, I'm happy to contribute whatever I can Wonderful. to help. Wonderful. And uh, let me welcome back, of course, my friend and cohort here, my partner in crime, Nullis. How are you doing today, sir? Hello. Hello, Jeff. Hello, Donald. Hello to the audience. And it's an honor, a very special privilege to have you with us today, Jeff. For sure. So before we get started, I wanted to do just some brief announcements. Um, Nellis will be starting his poetry cast on White Art Collective D Live. That's called Conversations with the Wind. That starts again uh, season two, October 25 uh, at 8 p.m. Uh, and exciting news that's around the same time as the White Art Collective Spooky Short Film Festival, which will be uh, the Friday before that Sunday. So that's going to be a very exciting weekend right there, October 25. And Jeff, if you could tell us more about the kind of shows that you've, you've, the White Art Collective is doing. I know there's a lot. Could you give, me a, give us a quick rundown? Yeah, I'd love to. So, um, so you've got that one, Conversations with the Wind, which is our poetry cast with Nullis. We're excited to have that coming back. Um, that's been a, a big hit, and it um, it's great to have give poets and uh, also some uh, writers, literature folks, and also sometimes musicians and things a platform to to talk about, you know, the writing and and the poetry in that. Uh, way kind of dissect it and so forth and so that's one of our uh, shows and then we have Saturday Night Livestream was our first show that we ever started and I just started that one uh, by myself back in November of 2018 mm -hmm. and uh, we play all kinds of different music from different types of musicians from all over the uh, western world um, we got we got folks from all over the place and uh, we do that every Saturday 9pm EDT followed by Dance Squared, which is a live DJ set with our resident DJ Boxcar. Mm -hmm. um, he's awesome. He's got an incredible setup, super talented dude. Yeah. Shout out um, to Boxcar, by the way. I follow him pretty closely. Everybody should tune into that Boxcar show. Yeah, Boxcar, he, he's great. Um, we are happy to have him. And let's see, then we have uh, Cinema Nazis, which is our film show. It's kind of, we do, we talk about like movie news. That's with myself and uh, Lord Wolfshield. We talk about movie news. He likes to talk about Hollywood. I've completely checked out, but it's, it's, it's nice that he still cares, I guess, about Hollywood or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, he likes uh, the, you know. the show with Stryker, by the way, was fantastic. I, I I thought that was one of the best shows. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. Stryker's a he's a cool guy, and yeah. you know that was a great great movie actually. Uh, Brother Two. There's there's very few movies that I can uh, bear to watch these days, but that was interesting. A uh, Russian film. Um, so coming from their perspective, you know, the kind of the coming to America from a Russian perspective was uh, mm -hmm. very interesting kind of uh, movie. But um, yeah, that was a lot of fun. And you've been on there. Uh, hyrith has been on there. Uh, Mark Brahman, Rich Hauk. We've had a lot of uh, great guests. We just our last one was with Jerome Schmidt, and we talked about he 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 works with uh, Thamster Whitnat, who's been uh, on this show a couple good of friend. times. Yeah, yes, good good, good good people. And he's been uh, he he's on EBL with him sometimes, and he also writes um, for Radix Journal. He does, mm -hmm. He's done some reviews and things for them. So, uh, but anyway, yeah, that's another one. Oh, we do trivia as well. And we also, you know, talk about the movies. So that's a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. Now, I understand you've started a karaoke show as well. Oh, yeah, we do. <laughs> we do have a karaoke show. Actually, tomorrow night is uh, episode number two. And yeah, we just get our friends together, Whack Pack and uh, some of our folks in our spheres. And mm -hmm. we sing karaoke. It's it's great because I feel like, you know, we don't get a chance to just kind of be silly and have fun. I'm, I plan on thoroughly embarrassing myself on the show tomorrow night. 
That's great. We're looking forward to that. Uh, now, are you singing uh, Rick Astley? Um, <laughs> never gonna break your heart. Never gonna I, make you cry. I, I, I'm, I'm trying to. Uh, I'm trying to. <laughs> how to say? I, I've spread a little rumor that I'm gonna dox myself on the show tomorrow, so we'll leave that as a surprise. But <laughs> I will be covering uh, "Video Killed the Radio Star." And uh, recently there was a hilarious gif with uh, two famous people from Hitler singing that with one of those deep fakes. Um, what was the other one? Um, I think maybe the Pina Colada song. <laughs> oh, that's a good one, too. That's embarrassing. That's embarrassing. <laughs> exactly, exactly. That's plenty so embarrassing. So don't yeah, ever that's say that I don't have a sense of humor. That's <laughs> Oh, we also have the Our Culture show, right? Yes, Our Culture. That's uh, it's another one of our uh, flagship shows. That's a good. That we bring in people from within our spheres and give them the opportunity the opportunity to kind of not not a lot of these people mostly talk about politics, so we kind of take them out of that paradigm to where they can talk about culture and uh, you know that kind of thing, um, which is nice because it's it's a uh, very white pilling to hear them talk about things that they like, things that they're interested in, music that moves them, uh, films perhaps that they like. And, you know, so um, one of our most recent guests was, uh, let's see, it was Emily Yukis. Yeah, so we, we mm -hmm. got to delve into her, um, the history of her artistry and, you know, her early love with animation, which was really fascinating. And it Emily's, was an exciting show. Uh, hats yeah. off to Ruth and Jack White as well for all the effort that they've put into bringing guests on like Kai Moros, etc. Yeah, they've been great. Um, Jack kind of he planted. He won't take credit for it, but he planted the seed for the the idea of that show, and uh, it's been very fruitful. And it's helped us to you know reach out to all the a lot of the different factions within our spheres that mm -hmm. you know normally kind of live in their own. Sil exist in their own silos but we're able to bring them in and kind of you know we can all be part of the undergirding culture so it's pretty mm -hmm. exciting powerful powerful stuff um so let's back out a little bit the three of us know each other very well um where you, you founded the white art collective nullis and i contribute to it and and then here we're nullis and i are, are working on this imperium art project to document the arts of the dissident right and and as well as talk to philosophers and other content producers about an art movement from the dissident right so this is a the overall picture of what we're looking at so the white art collective is a platform for various artists various shows and on every single episode of imperium art i i post a link below and I strongly urge people to get on board, get into the community, and also to share the heck out of these links. Get all your networks into it as well. It, this is an amazing uh, event happening. History is happening right now, and, and you can be a part of it. So please do get into the culture. And there's so much to choose from. It's an amazing buffet of uh, arts, of white identity politics. So, you know, everything from folk music to classical music to heavy metal to deep house, uh, it, it goes on and on. So I wanted to back up a little bit and just let any, anyone who's new to this show to just get to know you a little bit, Jeff, just briefly to talk about how did you come up with this idea of starting the White Art Collective? Well, so I myself am a writer, musician, filmmaker, and I've like DJed and things. And so um, back in 2017, I started to see the the tide turning even more against uh, European culture, white culture, and the arts. And having you know been kind of like struggling in the art scenes of various enclaves around the u.s um you know i i know kind of how the thing i know how the things work i know how they don't work i know where the struggles are i know how hard it is to get something produced i know how you know how much it sucks to try to have to do everything yourself etc mm -hmm. etc and then i saw that our culture was very much under attack and i saw that you know there's just a need for organization to get artists the support they need to be able to produce things, but also just to more broadly to as a to protect our culture by making it anew, by um, you know by talking about it in a positive light and 
you know, hopefully eventually getting the resources to literally preserve culture and making sure that, you know, precious artifacts are are preserved and treated with the level of respect and reverence that is appropriate. Um, so yeah, that's mm-hmm. basically, I'll give you kind of our, our, our mission here is to preserve, promote, celebrate, and expand upon our shared European culture. That's kind of the high level mm-hmm. mission statement. And, um, basically, like I said, I just, as an artist myself, I've been doing this for a long time. I just saw that all oh, this was under attack. I've continued continuously seen the direction things were going and mm-hmm. that, you know, something has to be done about it and you have to get organized if you want to do anything meaningful, basically. Sure, for sure. And we're all moving more and more towards organizing, and we're very inspired by your model as well. I wanted to ask you in the, in the time, it first of all, it blows my mind that this started only two years ago. It feels like four years or longer to me, but because there's just so much content coming out almost every day, it's crazy. But I wanted to ask you, what effects have you seen, say, you know, from then to now? How has the White Art Collective impacted the dissident right or the general political sphere that we're in? Well, I think, uh, yeah, right. Um, I mean, it's kind of hard to quantify right. in the broader sense. I think at the the micro sense, I see a lot of artists getting very excited that something like this exists and that there's something they can plug into to have a community of people who are like-minded creators. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that you really, you really need to have that. And then, then, then once they get and they get, start getting involved, then they, you know, they find that um, having that community, there's resources, there's people they can reach out to to help them get better at certain things. Uh, I saw today that, um, uh, you know, Hyrith was talking about, you know, working on getting better at mixing and mastering. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it, that's a whole art form, you know, and, and we have mm-hmm. some people who have really honed in on that art form, like mm-hmm. uh, the Decency's got great production skills yeah, sure. and um, a lot of you know, collaboration, I would say as well. Yeah, yeah, collaboration. And th- that's it. That's I mean, that's one of the main elements there is not just artistically collaborating, but also, you know, sharing knowledge because it, it's so hard to try to figure out how to do all this stuff yourself. You know, that it's like, so would, how about would you... crossing over into other shows and other sort of spheres and in, in the right wing, what other groups and people have you connected with in the past two years? Oh, we've uh, connected with all kinds of folks. I mean, we've been on most of the big, uh, mm-hmm. the biggest, you know, like in the uh, dissident right or white positive sphere, probably mm-hmm. better to call it that. Um, you know, we've been, we've made connections and been on red ice a number of times. Uh, mm-hmm. tap has been very supportive, uh, the after party, but no white Kuna, guilt. Yeah. yeah, no white guilt and, uh, and Jared great, George. Great. Sorry, um, that. we, we recently, uh, we've been on, um, patriotic weekly review with Mark Collette and he's been incredibly Fantastic. supportive. He's very excited about what we're doing. Cause, um, he's been in this for a long time as has Jason and they, they understand, you know, in the past, how much the cultural side of things was lacking. So uh, people who've been in this for a long time understand how important that is. And we, so we get a lot of uh, support from those folks. Um, went on the Ralph retort, you know, we've we've gotten support from a lot of, you know, I went on JF one time as well. We've, we've gotten support from a lot of the folks in these kind of spheres and, and adjacent as well. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, as well. And the what? Uh, Martel's show. Uh is it Dave Martel? Oh yeah, yeah. Well that's uh that's yeah, that's No White Guilt's uh his oh, show. That's an aspect of it. okay. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, we've he's features a lot of uh you know, a lot of white art collective artists. And the cool thing about it is, and in, in speaking of how we affect and how white art collective affects things, is you know, there's kind of a um there's kind of a pipeline upward. Actually we saw this with um how we ended up getting connected with Red Ice is that uh, Zorchwave made an animation to a Volk Dissident song or a piece called In Years to Come. And it was it was awesome. Just great. Just like mind blowing, blowingly um, 
cool and like really capturing the imagination and it really resonated with a lot of folks in our spheres and before we got kicked off youtube it was our most viewed video it didn't have nearly as many views as it deserved but it had enough to trickle kind of upward yeah and like red ice you know got wind of it and they played it on their show and then i ended up getting on there you know and that's kind of the same way with like the chuck martell thing is like well someone will tell me about something like um Handsome Horse often, you know, will give me, suggest some music to me, but also people who are just, you know, friends of ours on Gab, and they'll be like, oh, hey, check out White Art Collective, and then I'll feature somebody, you know, and then they'll they'll be on uh, Saturday Night Live stream, and then, mm-hmm. like, Jason might hear of, of them, and then, uh, then he'll put them on, you know, Chuck Martell, and it kind of keeps going up and up and up until okay. it gets more and more viewership, and there's actually, like, for instance... You know, Hyrith being involved with us, she ended up collaborating with Zurius, and then her mm-hmm. song "Keep in Mind" um, that really resonated with a lot of people in the uh, the white positive sphere. And then a bunch of people were playing that song, like Iconoclast, I think, and some other people were started playing that song on like their their bigger shows. Some people who had you know like hundred thousand subscribers on YouTube. Super. Super. You, YouTubes. And so, yeah, I mean, it, it's, I think there's a trickle up effect of culture of like people are kind of, you know, kind of paying attention and seeing like what we're able to find. And then we kind of put it into the pipeline in a sense. Mm-hmm. And it's worth mentioning that people in the White Art Collective produce a lot of content for the White People's Quarterly uh, put out by the White People's Press as well. And I'll, I'll leave a uh, link to that below. Um, so, Interesting. Then let's talk a little bit more about the White Art Collective. It, it's, it's, gosh, I don't know how many people are in it right now. I, could you give us a ballpark figure of how many different creators are in it? Yeah. So I was counting up the other day. We've got about 110 artists, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. that's not including like nice. a lot of people. Since we went on PWR a few months ago, I've I've had a really hard time keeping up uh, <laughs> with com- communications, and actually we're starting to make. This, which is this is good, and I think this is how an organization grows in a healthy and organic way. Is I'm having to start like making people liaisons for their various mediums, like music liaisons, poetry and literature liaison. We need a visual art liaison. So basically, mm-hmm. like these, they can kind of be the point of contact for these various artists because we've already got so many people that I, I can't keep up with it, you know, and try to do the other various tasks that I'm trying to do. And also we were producing so much content. I can't keep it uploaded to bit shoot. Well, yeah. I'm three weeks behind. So we're also got somebody who's going to help do that. So literally everything is just, um, growing so much and there's so much activity going on that it's, you know, it, it's been, that's, we're entering phase whack 2.0, which is where, <laughs> Okay. It's like we're we're going to start becoming a more formalized organization. Right. You know, it's kind of been me, obviously, with lots of support, but like I was still handling a lot of most of the kind of behind the scenes stuff. Yeah. And and now we have to make it to where I'm not a bottleneck slowing it down because I am uh, the yeah. communications and also like the technical stuff. Like uh, we, we got to get those things to mm-hmm. where we not so we're not losing momentum and energy, you know. So I would imagine there's a lot of volunteering in um, among the the group. That's what it sounds like. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of, uh, and it's been great because people have been stepping up and um, being, you know, being willing to spend more of their time um, helping the White Art Collective to grow. Mm-hmm. And it's good because Thanks. I think we're finding, I think we're finding uh, roles for people that make sense Very for what they're interested in and what they're good at. This is just brilliant to hear. I, I think artists in general, two things. One, we, you know, we're, we're so in our own worlds, but we can become too much in our own worlds and we have to plug into our community and then to play a role in that community as, as well. To, whatever your strengths are, you know, if you're helping someone to learn a software or, I'm, you know, I, I've helped out with various, uh, you know, design concepts or or even just giving people some positive feedback on a project they're doing but 
to play a role in the organization. It's kind of the other hat that we as artists in, in the White Art Collective have to do. So that's great. It, it gives us more a sense of meaning and, and a greater sense of satisfaction as well. So I did have a kind of a fun question in, in, a, in a perfect world with an unlimited budget. <laughs> what would you do? What would you do with White Art Collective? I'll give you a blank check. Go for it. Well, I would, uh, I would, I would pay these people uh, a decent salary mm -hmm. so that we could all do this full time, mm -hmm. and then we could we would grow that much faster. We'd be able to find that many more patrons, mm -hmm. and then uh, we would be producing, you know, Hollywood but better level yeah. quality films. Uh, mm -hmm. We'd be having, you know, sponsoring large events kind of like we'd have our own south by southwest probably one in the spring one in the fall um and we, we would be developing artists you know we would have an irl presence like a studio actually we'd, you know we would have them in a number of different places i'm actually looking at that right now is is thinking about you know having creating kind of the first dedicated space studio space that's something i've always just lacked in general in my years of producing uh, music and film and all kind of creative ventures is, you know, I'm always like, Oh, I work in my kitchen. I work in the bedroom. Yeah, sure. You really need dedicated space, you know, oh, yeah. for, for this oh, kind yeah. of stuff, um, to really, to really, uh, take it to the next level. So, mm -hmm. you know, that's something, but, uh, yeah, yeah. That, I mean, that's that, what I would do. I, I would invest. Okay. Yeah, create in a sense of business. I've often said we have to create our, our own Hollywood, our own CNN, our own universities. We have to recreate pretty much the whole world in our in our likeness, so to speak. But this ties into some of your points uh, off air. You were saying you wanted to touch on some things that Jefferson Lee talked about in our last episode. And anybody who's listening to this, we strongly urge you to go back and check out the Jefferson Lee episode, episode 15, I believe. Um, you were saying that we're, we're at ground zero with infrastructure. You wanted to talk about funding ideas. Could you riff on that a bit? Yeah, I did. I did. Um, so I, I did have to take exception to some of the things that Jefferson said. And let me preface this by saying that I like Jefferson. I, I think that he's a very intelligent guy. I think he's he's got some interesting takes on things. I used to watch his show whenever he and, and Josh Neal started coming about and started gaining uh, popularity in our spheres. I was I was like, this is a good thing because these guys are regular guys they're just healthy normal guys who are thinking about these things they're intelligent and mm. they are you know this well is the spoken. kind of leadership we need yes well spoken yeah. exactly mm. eloquent mm -hmm. and uh that's what Indeed. we need you know that's yeah. what kind of stuff we need but um so yeah anyway so i did have to take exception to that because uh i just think that that's wrong that's incorrect and i also have to take exception to the well, fact that it exactly is incorrect i'm not clear on that exactly that we're at ground zero like oh, that we're at ground zero yeah that, that he's like that nothing and the other thing that bothered me about that is he said that and you know perhaps he has some personal reasons or or whatever you know i don't know all the behind the scenes i'm sure there's relevant reasons but so he was essentially gone for a year and just kind of like out you know, not in these spheres at all. I did no, I didn't hear from him and I didn't, and I, I think that's what he was saying on the show. And then, so he comes back a year later and he's like, why isn't there infrastructure? Why isn't, why aren't things built? Why, what, what were you guys doing? What, what's, what's wrong with you? I mean, like, that's like a, that's like a, uh, a foreman walking away from a job and then, coming back a year later and being like, Hey, why didn't you guys, why didn't you guys finish this? Why didn't you guys build this? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And, uh, I, yeah, I'm busting his chops here a bit, but I think it's warranted because this, this is a, a problem that nobody wants to do the incremental, the, the unglorious work yeah, of just the day-to-day -day boring yeah. mundane, you know, like building of infrastructure, building of institutions. It's not, it's not glorious. It's not waving a flag and going into battle, so to speak, you know? Mm -hmm. And again, I think Jefferson's a good guy, but like that just struck me as being very rich that someone who has been away for a year is going to come back and say, 
where is everything? So there's a lot of stuff he doesn't know about. And I would, I would posit that he really doesn't know much about what we're doing uh, because I've never really interacted with him. And I don't think he's ever really looked into what we're doing other than what you guys were telling him about. Mm. And uh, yeah. And th- again, it's, it's the building of infrastructure. It's the slow and steady. You, it takes time to, to build these things up. And right now what we're actually more focused on is like get you got to get the networks of people connected, you know, before we can kind of be a powerhouse of, of, uh, media, you have to find the people who can play the roles to produce that media, you know, like we need the infrastructure of, for instance, um, we've got some guys who are building a live streaming site you know, we need that because we don't know how long we're going to be on DLive. We could go to all this trouble in all these other areas yeah, and then not have any place to live stream on. You, which are, would be you have your ridiculous. own live stream. Is that correct? You have your own live streaming or I should say the White Art Collective has its own live streaming well, site. They're actually it's actually a, a separate entity. These are some gentlemen uh, that, yeah, they're, they're they created this on their own. It's called uh, white positive dot media. Nice. And. And then they, so that's the archive site. And then they have a live streaming uh, portion, which is called live.whitepositive.media. Now, I think they're trying to acquire the name white.live, which will be the main uh, live streaming. But we've, we've live streamed on it. I mean, it works. You know, there's a, there's a little glitch here and there, but I mean, we're talking about guys on a shoestring budget who are just doing this themselves. You know what I mean? They're just mm-hmm. younger guys figuring yeah. this out, you know, you know, yeah. so you can imagine if they actually had Money. any resources at all, right? <laughs> yeah. which, you know, now that's the part that, um, I agree of course with Jefferson on that. Like you need money. There's a lot you can do with like people volunteering and stepping forward and, you know, but at the end of the day, like, like with me, like I've been completely, uh, t- completely uh, taxed as much as I can be. That's why I was like three months behind on messaging people, you know. And it, it finally got to the point where it's like, okay, I have to, out of necessity, other people have to step up. You know what I mean? And yeah. and it's like we're we're just finally at that point where I think people understand. It's like if you want to go to the next level, people are going to have to carry more Mm -hmm. weight, you know, many (laughs) hands make light work, but so people, and people have been stepping up, but you know, you can't, you can't indefinitely just have a volunteer force. We're not going to overcome like this incredibly well-funded, literally they just print money and charges interest for our own money. We're not going to overcome that force and the global media structure with volunteer power. We have to fund it and so, yeah, we're going to have to figure out how to do that. That's, again, back to infrastructure. We're integrating Monero into the White Art Collective site. And I think we're going to try to integrate Monero also into the uh, white positive dot media, you know, because that's that's a new and innovative way to get funding. Mm-hmm. An- and another element, kind of going back to, to Jefferson talking about funding, and I don't want to straw man him here, but uh, people kind of always... He's right, and I think this is a point that he's made in a lot of a lot of his uh, podcasts and stuff. Like, there are, um, you know, he's he's like, we need the elites. We need we need our own elites. We need yes. these these kind of big power blocks of people that have money. This is how you know, it's mm-hmm. it can't all be done by the farmer with the pitchfork kind of thing. Sure, and I, sure. I think that's that's true to an extent, but I don't necessarily. First of all, I don't think we should sit back and and wait for some elites to come and save us. The elites who just the elites mm-hmm. who love us. There, I think there's this kind of fantasy that we just need elites who care about us. Mm-hmm. I don't think that that's realistic. You know, I don't think that's how systems mm-hmm. work. I don't think that's necessarily how people work. Mm-hmm. So I, I think we got to go. I'm, I wouldn't deny uh, a billionaire who wants to come and fund us, of course, or a millionaire or a thousandaire or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, everybody's yeah. welcome. But I mean, I'm not going to hold my breath and wait for these people to show up because a lot of people who have money have are benefiting from this system that's destroying us. So right. they it's kind of inherently, you know, they just they're they're inherently not really going to, you know, help. So the thing the thing is this with funding with things like cryptocurrencies like Monero and with the Internet, 
there's no reason we can't get clever and do crowdfunding. Like we can raise money from people all across the world in ways that you could have never done in the past. You know, you could raise hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars if you get the right projects in place. Um, people will fund it, you know, especially if it's like, hey, are you sick of Hollywood? Yes, like so yeah. many people are. Well, help us fund this, but we got to prove it. We have to legitimize ourselves mm -hmm. so that they see that they're, mm -hmm. they're, they can trust us with their money. And we do that by starting smaller, by doing a little spooky short film festival. Yeah, I, you know what I, I mean? Would, I would argue that there's already ample, ample evidence that we can pull that off. There's, I mean, we're, we're producing so much as the White Art Collective Weekly that uh, we certainly could have our own channel, a TV channel or something of this nature. But yeah, um, Nullis, I'm sorry, I've been a little rude. Did you want to chime in or add any of your thoughts to any of this? Well, there's there's just so much that that was uh, discussed, and I I have to agree with uh, with Jeff on on everything that he said. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I do believe that um, waiting for large funders and donors to arrive is 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 not really the right strategy. Um, but I think that there is a segment of the population that are secretly interested and and maybe even fellow travelers at best, um, who who could be swayed. And and we're talking more, you know, the upper middle class kind of people that that have some uh, disposable income, and and that could be an interesting uh, uh, demographic to tap. But these are all strategies. These are all approaches. And and I think that you know the way the way everything is working now with the White Art Collective and the way it's it's uh, evolving, the amount of interest that it's uh, uh, collecting, um, not just in uh, in our. Uh, smaller spheres, but even outside of it, in in the greater uh, uh, community, you can see that there's an interest in it, and people are hungry for alternative art. They're hungry for music that isn't degenerate. They're hungry for literature that speaks to them. So I think that there's a lot going on, and so you know, there's a, we have to understand that infrastructure doesn't build itself. Infrastructure is not sexy. Infrastructure is hard work. You got to roll up your sleeves, and and that's where Jeff is absolutely correct. You know, with you know, we can talk about things ad nauseum, but then you know, if we never do anything about it, then it really isn't worth anything. Mm -hmm. So what what the White Art Collective, I believe, has achieved is is a phenomenal success. Yeah. Um, I think that that um, the community itself, and I think that's what I really more what I wanted to touch upon the community, and I can speak for myself. It's inspired me, the community, uh, the people in the White Art Collective have inspired me in many ways, in more ways than maybe even I realize. And um, the collaborations, the support, the positive feedback, the encouragement, uh, the recommendations, the various kinds of uh, advice on, on technical things, it, it moved me from just uh, writing a few poems and then just posting it somewhere online and just leaving it there to buying a mic to recording my stuff, to then now I'm experimenting with uh, video editing and I'm trying to create these little video vignettes with the uh, uh, with my poem and then incorporating music into it. And so it's it's inspired me to do more. Um, and, and Jeff, you know, inspired me a lot in saying, hey, you know, why don't you do the, uh, uh, do a poetry class? And I've never thought about it. It was really Jeff who, who, who asked me if I would be willing to do it. And I said, sure. And I didn't know what I was getting myself into, and and I, I don't regret a moment of it. I mean, I, I love it. I think this is a phenomenal thing. The people that I'm speaking to, the you know, the reactions that I get, the comments that I get from people, it's just all good stuff. And so, this also, I believe, a lot of the interactions that I've had in uh, in the White Art Collective has also been a very strong element. And I'm not so sure if it's that. Uh, obvious, but in the essay that I wrote on Imperium Art, there's a lot of elements in there that I uh, that I've learned and 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 also understood through the White Art Collective. So so for me, Imperium Art and the White Art Collective are, are symbiotic; they belong to each other, and so that's why it's such a great thing to have Jeff finally on, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And and so so you know, there's things like you know when I write about the collaboration of the continuum through the Imperium, what am I talking about? I'm saying 
let's collaborate, let's learn from each other, let's grow, let's inspire each other. That's really what that is. And that's what the White Art Collective is doing. Mm. And so that, for example, is a classic thing where, where that was purely inspired by all the different artists that, I, that I've interacted with through the White Art Collective. Um, so, so what I'd like to say is that, you know, w maybe the question to Jeff is, how does he see, and, and, and I don't know if you wanted to segue into the Imperium Art conversation yet, Donald, but maybe it would be a good way to segue to ask to see how he sees this connection between the Imperium, between Imperium Art and, and the White Art Collective. We, we certainly can. I just do want to give Jeff a moment. There were a couple points that he wanted to cover. So I don't know if we want to. Oh, I'm sorry. That. Then I will retract that question. Well, not at all. It's just <laughs> I'm just trying to be organized. That's all because I want that's to make fine. sure that's that fine. Jeff mm -hmm. But I mean, that's obviously the, the, the key question that we're really anxious to, to hear is what are his thoughts on Imperium are this project. Um, so this remains a question, the concept of, of funding and infrastructure. I think the structure is there. The funding ideas, I, I guess there's, there's different models that are clearly available, you know, selling, I don't know, sponsorship, advertisers, et cetera, uh, 501C. That, you know, I think it seems to me like maybe all of the creators in the White Art Collective could do a little research on funding and then bring it back to the pool and or the people listening to this show could step up and help us out as well. Uh, I think that we are a community. We're not just the guys on the stage. You know, you guys in the audience are part of this as well. We depend on you to share this show, to join this community, be a part of it and share it, get involved in what we're doing and speak up. Don't be shy. You know, we're, we're just regular folks like you. So, that I think is we'll kind of we'll leave the funding question for a little bit. And I wanted to go on to Jeff's other question about who is the White Art Collective audience. Jeff, would you like to try to answer that? Yeah. Can, can I just say one more thing about the funding thing? Of if you course. Don't mind? Of course. I, I, I just wanted to kind of quickly outline the the model that I've been developing that we're going to implement on the new website is okay. that there's going to be like different types of roles I'll, I'll go over this very quickly there's going to be artists uh allied organizations affiliates and affiliates mm -hmm. are basically like if someone starts a channel and they play white art collective music or feature our uh, artist of any kind in some way or white people's uh press would be like an affiliate sure um and then you would have uh patrons and crew and so the idea with the, and, and then there's levels of all of these different types. Like you start out as a guest when you first kind of get involved with the organization, you sign up, you know, we don't really know who you are. We let you into the, uh, the, the website and you, you can go around and fraternize with artists and you'll be able to look at different projects that people are working on. People will be able to, you know, work on projects within the site, do file sharing, all of that kind of stuff. And, you know, you'll be able to see people posting their art and getting, you know, feedback on it and this kind of thing. And um, basically, like you, like I said, everybody can, and you'll start out as a guest artist, a guest patron, etc. But then you can work your way up in the organization. You eventually become a member. You become a member artist or affiliate or allied organization or patron. By with, but for patron, since we were talking about funding, is by you know you give some kind of money, and you have the option. You can either. Uh, give money to a particular artist, you can give money to a particular project, or you can give money to the White Art Collective as a whole. So it gives you the opportunity to look, you get in there, you look around and you see what's happening and what do you want to see more of, you know, so you get some some choice in there. And, and I then, would imagine they have some impact on, on the direction of development as well. Yeah, it, exactly. They could be invited into the project itself. And yeah. of course, you know, I mean, there's no getting away from the fact that, you know, producers, people who lay down big money, executive producers on a film or any big project. Yeah, I mean, I, they should have some input. Um, you know, there's there's a delicate balance there between the artist and that kind of sure. thing. But, sure. but you know, um, and, and perhaps we could mediate that. And that's that's another thing we can we can potentially do. Um, but, um, that's, it's still like they could, yeah, they could have input. They could, they could just put the money down for something they just want to see just in general. And, and the artist can, they can find the right artist to bring that to life, whatever the case may be. Um, and then people can work their way up to pillar status, which is, you know, of any of these different roles, which is basically like 
um, you're very consistent. Like I would consider both of you guys like pillars of the white art collective. You've been here from the very beginning. You've uh, created a lot of content. You've helped it grow immensely, you know, um, and, and we have a number of uh, pillars that we have are already helped us to get it to this point. And so basically that just incentivizes people of all of the different roles, including people, patrons, you know, it's like it, it, it gives you a little bit of status, which, you know, people just like that we're human beings mm -hmm. and um it gives them the opportunity to support and and be really participating in part of it and like you said they can even have meaningful input on the projects themselves so i just wanted to kind of give Beautiful. people a, so, an idea of how that we're, we're that's developing you know i can proudly say now that i'm a white pillar white pill sorry dumb joke that's right uh, so, <laughs> uh, it's, it's a little pause there. Anyway, uh, that is brilliant, Jeff. That is so beautiful. And I'm, I, I don't know if you've even brought this up publicly yet, but I mean, I, if, if so, this is fabulous. And people need to get in touch with Jeff to be a part of all this stuff. And again, there's, there's always going to be links uh, towards the bottom of the show here. Um, that's exclusive. Donald, no, that's exclusive for you, Donald. That's for you guys. Oh, oh boy. I am, <laughs> I'm going to peacock around the room for a little while. Hold on. Uh, Donald, just I wanted to add a, a comment to all of this, the organization funding and et cetera with uh, the White Art Collective. Mm -hmm. And I think this also ties into the, at least my understanding of one of the major goals of the White Art Collective is to inspire others. So I think that through this organization, through the, the all the work that's being done, all the work that Jeff is doing um, and, and all the work that all the artists are doing at the White Art Collective, hopefully will inspire others to create similar institutions and organizations in a similar fashion with different functions. And we're talking about legal aid, we're talking about different kinds of uh, maybe business development communities, things like that, of whatever your expertise is, whatever your background is. And, and hopefully by, by example, the White Art Collective can inspire others to then start thinking about what they can do in their immediate community and the broader community in terms of organizing and rolling up their sleeves and doing something really uh, important. Mm -hmm. so yeah, absolutely. Get in touch. We... Yeah, everybody just get in touch with us. It's really very simple. Um, so another question for you, Jeff. Um, we want to talk a little bit about getting underneath people's Pavlovian conditioning. You're know, talking about uh, uh, people sort of exiting the paradigm by with us speaking in lexicon of in a lexicon of symbols, sounds, colors, tropes. Basically, doing with art what uh, Jason Kuna is doing with language on going free. You know, coming up with terms like Western kind, Western bio spirit. The, the, these are huge topics and something that we in the art, uh, in in the Imperium art and in the White Art Collective should be discussing. How can we create dialectic? as a way to get around people's conditioning, anti-white conditioning. So Jeff, did you wanna comment on that a bit? Yeah, definitely. We've been having a lot of internal discussions about optics and about, um, you know, why would you play this band and not play that band? You know, why would you do this? Some people wanna kinda of play on the edgier kind of uh, optics aesthetics because they think that that will draw you know, people in, and there's, there's definitely people who are really into that and, um, who get excited by that, etc. But I think that the perspective that I come from, um, and just also, I, I wouldn't tell them that they can't make that. I don't ever tell anybody like you can't no. make that art, you know, you know me, I'm an artist too. Like nobody tells me what I can make and not make, you know, <laughs> yeah, we don't, we don't do that, you know, no. but but I do try to encourage people to like shape things. And I think that that's why the Imperium art uh, discussion is important and why a lot of the things that we do is, is important and why the, the intellectual discussions that happen in, in our spheres are important. You know, it helps to shape the way people think and the lens through which they, they see things and how we approach this strategically and otherwise. So when it comes to... Um, the Pavlovian conditioning. So for anybody who's not aware, right, there was this, there were these, um, uh, the study done, or it was an experiment where they were essentially, so they would, they would put food in front of a dog and 
the dog would salivate. You know, there was there was a trained reaction. I mean, well, it's it's a physiological reaction to the food, the stimuli of food, right? It's just something the body does. And and then what they found is they would they then they would start ringing a a bell, and then give the dog food, right? So they ring a bell and give the dog food. So then they the dog began like physiologically associating the bell with the food. So then what they found is they could just ring the bell and the dog would salivate, right? Mm-hmm. And, I, and I think this is this is also called like classical conditioning, mm-hmm. right? It's just like a it's a psychological phenomenon that's that's uh, I, I learned about it first in like psychology one hundred and one in college, sure. you know, and, sure. and and it's you know it's coupled obviously with like a literal physiological response. So I'm and I mean human beings we're the same way, you know. You can you can train people to have reactions to certain stimuli. You can you can train people to where when they see a swastika, they have a certain reaction. People, a lot of people will have literally have like a, re, a repulsed, like physical, you know, emotional. Some people might even, you know, literally just freak out. You know, <laughs> if they see something like that. Uh, we're seeing that these days, right? People are just they're losing their minds and they have uh, Trump derangement syndrome. And, you yes, know, yes. some of it's fake, but. Uh, some of it, I think these people really are. They're just, oh, they're yeah. just, they're trained it's to, you know, psychosis. they're conditioned. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, knowing this and knowing that people have been conditioned to have a reaction, it's not, it's not even really a rational thing. And we have to, on some level, accept, you know, most people are not rational. They just, they're trained to have a, a reaction to certain stimuli. So if they see, uh, if they see someone speaking um, sympathetically about Hitler, like they're going to have a, a programmed reaction to that. And they also know that they're going to, if they don't have that dramatic reaction, they're going to get in trouble and they're going to be socially ostracized, et cetera. And there's a whole slew of, of yeah. symbols that we all know, you know, like the right, Stalingrad right. and all these things of 1488. And okay, so the way that I, I, I try to curate. I, I think that uh, what Jason Kuna is doing is really brilliant, and I think he he understands this more than anybody. Like the mimetics of mm-hmm. this entire struggle, and what he's laid out with the language of taking people out of the existing narrative, taking them out of the paradigm, because. Like if you start arguing with somebody about, um, oh, and you accept the concept of racism, right? They already have a set of conditioned, trained sure. responses, emotional responses, verbal responses. Yeah. You know, most people are just, if they think you're a racist, they're just going to walk away and be like, you are a bad person and they're going to leave. You know, right. I, I simply tell them they pronounced race realism wrong, but go on. Yeah. Well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. But but so take keeping taking all this into account, essentially, you know, what I'm trying to do and what I think we should generally be trying to do is essentially what we're trying to do with art, what Jason is doing with language. We are we we don't want to just use the same. We don't want to just fall into the same traps like like, for instance, like the skinhead aesthetic, you know, that has been already established like you know the film uh american history x to me that's like the nail in the coffin of people who like or i mean that's the nail in the coffin of that aesthetic that is the bad guy that's so drilled into people's minds if you go around looking like that guy you just look like the bad guy you know it doesn't matter what you say it doesn't matter like you can't get around years and years of this this conditioning, this Pavlovian you, conditioning, you know? You delegitimize anything you say simply by the way that you look, but go on, yeah. Exactly. You like, yeah, exactly. And again, that I don't, you know, if we lived in a sane and free society, you would actually listen to what someone says and you would sit down and listen to his reasoned argument or whatever. But like, mm-hmm. we all know that that's not how most of this functions, right? Mm-hmm. So... What basically the way I kind of and I'm just kind of developing my thinking on this more so in preparing to discuss this with you guys. And because we've had so many people, you know, uh, we've had a number of debates about this recently. So I'm I'm having to figure out how to articulate it. And Mm -hmm. I think that essentially what it is, is 
we just again, just in the same way that Jason is used, doing that in the language, taking people out of that paradigm, I think we have to do that same thing artistically. We have to do it with the musical sounds, with the symbols, with the colors, with the tropes, you know, ev- how we frame anything in everything in a story, in a film, in a song, in a sculpture. Mm-hmm. We have to take, you know, it's it it requires us being more creative, like to to yeah. to not just use those existing tropes that already have those assigned Pavlovian responses. We can communicate the very that's the thing. You can communicate mm-hmm. the same idea that you wanted to get across, but you just have to get more creative about it and and figure out how to break get underneath that conditioning, you know, mm-hmm. and communicate to them in a way in a different way that they've never heard before. That's the trick. Like you have Mm -hmm. to say that in a way that they don't already have a a planned response to, you know? Mm -hmm. And in a beautiful artistic way too. That's emotionally. Yeah, Yeah. exactly. Exactly. That, that, that gets underneath it as well. Just when something really touches them, you know, but if it has those triggers in there, it'll confuse the signal and they will be, you know, they, they won't, it won't come across. So I think like, and let me get, okay. So we've kind of laid out like a very abstract ideological. Let me give, let me give an example of what I'm talking about. Okay. If you don't mind. Of course. Yeah. Go for it. I have a ton to say on that topic, but please go ahead. Sure. Yeah. Um, so, so there was a, we, we had a disagreement of a gentleman who wanted to play a song, uh, on whack called race or a band called race war. Right. Mm. And, and um, I didn't want to play it, and it's not that I'm I'm totally against you know kind of like the the people who made that kind of music, kind of the '90s kind of skinhead kind of music. Like I've never really been into that stuff, but there's some people who really enjoy that kind of music. I'm familiar with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I think that that's that's all well and good, you know. But like to me, like that that aesthetic that when someone hears the band, the name of the band is Race War people immediately associate it with that scene and they immediately associate it. Like that's the, those are the bad guys, you know, that's, that's, that's the guy from American history. Right. And so, and then, so, so that's an example on that side. And then the, on the other side, I was like, but I will play blood of tyrants. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's like, why that sounds violent and why would you not want to play race war but you would play blood of tyrants what was blood of tyrants first of all that phrase comes from the thomas jefferson uh, the tree of you know f- the mm-hmm. thomas jefferson quote the tree of liberty must be replenished from time to time with the blood Blood-up of patriots tyrants. and tyrants right tyrants. well people overwhelmingly the people you know it, that we're going to be able to uh, you know appeal to are probably going to be fans of Thomas Jefferson, you know, yeah. they're American pay. I mean, at least they're American audience, right? They, yeah, indeed, indeed. they're, they're going to, they're going to think of uh, Thomas Jefferson is a, a great man. He was one of the founders of the nation. I mean, he's a storied, he's a legend, oh, yeah. you know, I mean, incredible human being, right? So like you can, and also the lyricist the, for uh, blood of tyrants, he's very clever. He does, he, again, he does it in his lyrics. Like, he doesn't use the same tropes. He doesn't use the same kind of tropes that like like the race war thing would evoke in people. He's very clever about the way he writes his lyrics. If he if he weren't, I wouldn't I wouldn't play it, you know. Yeah. But that's just that's just kind of an example of like the difference and why like the blood of the tyrants, it takes people out of it while connecting people back to this very patriotic figure who who is a hero to people, you know, like in no matter what. It, you know, as opposed to kind of like the, the American history X trope, which that just, that those guys, they're the bad guy and they're always going to be seen that way to the, by the majority of the population. Absolutely. This is a a massive topic of huge can of worms, if you will. And I'm, I'm totally on board with your thinking. I get it. I think that there's, I don't know how to phrase this exactly, but there's content for us within our private circles and then there's content for kind of the rest of the world. And I also feel that, you know, we are legitimately angry and that when we, you know, <laughs> you know people on the BBC can say, oh, you know, kill Whitey. But if we put a song out that shows our anger that, you know, et cetera, et cetera, white replacement, genocide, et cetera, then somehow, oh, my God, you can't you can't express that feeling that that's 
that's brutal and very, very unfair. And it actually creates that violence. But getting back to where we're looking at, we're looking at the kind of the overall artistic inflection that you're you're having in a, a, an impact on here. You're making, in a sense, a, a statement and also you're designing a pathway for creators in the white art collective, in Imperium art, to say, listen, we have to get our message out. We can, you know, have our little memes and our pepes and this and that among ourselves. We can share the Sonnengrad among ourselves. But our mission is to change the world for ourselves, to, to save the white race from replacement, genocide, etc. Therefore, we have to use clever strategies and can't <laughs> work within the, the dialectic of the left. They, they basically control the dialectic. They control the media. They've already th thoroughly and profoundly brainwashed white people across the globe. And we see that everywhere through the policies and all the problems that we're having. So I'm certainly aligned with you. I, I'm, I'm more interested in breaking down the how of that. Like, how do we do that? I did bring this up earlier when the Imperium Art uh, show started. And uh, Semiagog, who many of you know, is a fantastic, brilliant uh, content producer in the dissident right he basically was saying, you know, we don't have to reinvent a language. We already have one. It's our mythology and our history, etc. And I certainly, as an individual artist, I, I'm, I'm, of course, I'm, yeah, I get it. You know, I, I, that's obvious. But I also sort of want to recreate or, or rather create a new language that is for us now. You know, I want to do what Jason Kuna is doing. I want, you know, he, the, the concept of the Western bio spirit or the word Western kind and all these dialectics. I, I want to be able to proudly say, well, I, I invented this symbol or I, I invented this trope or, or I'm creating art that says these kinds of things. And I'm, I'm working on it. You know, anyone who looks at my Twitter page, that's the, the image right at the top there that you can, you can have a look at, but um, oh, go ahead. No, it's, yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to add to this. I think that um, everything that was said is is are all valid and very, very uh, uh, important points. But I think that what we need to also understand is that there's a certain urgency a lot of people feel of the environment that we're in which we're living right now. And and there's also this this uh, relentless pressure that's being pushed on us through external forces that are trying to denigrate and delegitimize us. So there's a, uh, a legitimate emotional response to this. And so, so we have to, I think, at least in my view, before we speak about language and before we speak about the optics of it, I think we, we need to address, and this is what I speak about in my essay, we need to speak about the emotional positioning that we have. We need to understand where we are in, in this culture war and this culture struggle, I personally, again, I'm not trying to black pill anyone, but I genuinely believe that we're in what I would call a uh, culture insurgency. It's not a negative thing. It's just embracing the reality of the fact that our institutions have been subverted, uh, appropriated. Our positioning is we're not on an equal level with those that we're competing with uh, or against. And and we don't have the resources that they do. So so calling it a war would be kind of, uh, I think, a little bit uh, optimistic. I think that what what in my view we have to focus on is how we strategize our approach, and and the first step for that is embracing the full emotional spectrum of who we are. And that's when I talk about the cognitive dominance and the culture insurgency, how we have to embrace everything that we feel, whether that's anger, frustration, um, rage, whatever those things are, love, um, uh, compassion, all of these emotions, we need to embrace the full spectrum of the emotion. The question is, how do we contextualize this, this emotion? Um, and then that's where the, the concept of cognitive dominance comes into play, which basically is, and I'm just going to quote the uh, 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 the, the military term that was, uh, it's, it's also a, a scientific term, but in the military sense, and we're speaking of metaphorically of war and cultural wars, uh, quote, commanders that attained cognitive dominance were those that could navigate the fog of war 
in order to decipher meaning in a sea of noise and convey its meaning to others. And I think that's exactly what it is that we're trying to do through our art, through our language, through our symbolism. And I think that we need to really take a, uh, I'm not saying put it aside because the symbolism is extremely important. And I also believe that the strategy is also very important. But before we even go there, we need to understand and fully embrace our emotional spectrum. And that's where I talk about in the next uh, uh, segment of my essay about the, dialect the dialectics of artistic violence, right? Because we're not talking about um, promoting violence, and that's not what I'm trying to say with that. What I am saying is that we all feel we're humans. We feel all these different uh, emotions. We need to put this in balance. We need to understand where we are and how we want to move forward. And so by putting it in balance, it gives us a much more uh, stronger position to be able to understand where we stand in vis-a-vis -vis the uh, uh, the adversary, if we will, if you will, and also ourselves, and understanding and acknowledging in ourselves, you know, our successes and also our failures. So a lot of these things, there's a lot going on emotionally. There's a lot going on subconsciously. I think that that we need to address, and I think that that's an important aspect that. I see at least, and I'm not trying to criticize anyone because I believe everything that you guys are saying is absolutely valid and important and true. But what I am saying is that I think that this aspect is kind of always put to the side a little bit. And I think that we need to focus a little bit on giving our, uh, giving the support where needed, giving the inspiration where needed and giving a little bit of a, how should I say, uh, opening up that, that, uh, um, the the uh, the faucet a little bit once in a while to let that you know that that energy come out because we don't want to lose the energy there's a lot of energy in this when people you know if you, if you feel a certain way very strongly about something there's a lot of energy in it so the question we have to ask ourselves is how can we tap into this energy and recontextualize it and make it a positive a force of uh, good a force of positive uh, change what do you say, Jeff? Well, one of the things I, I agree with you on is that we, we have to recognize where we are and, and something and as frustrated and as angry as people might want to be. And of course, it's, it's all totally relevant and valid that they're angry. I'm angry, too. You know, I'm uh, incredibly frustrated and angry and you know, I go through my Twitter feed and see all of these attacks and all of these horrible injustices and they just add up and up and they're yeah. just, it's never ending. And I, you know, I kind of internalize all of it. I don't turn away from it. I kind of want to internalize it. Um, but like you said, we, you know, we're not on an equal footing. I agree with you. Um, so we can't punch out of our, our weight class. And in a sense, like one of the, well, one of the things most definitely, right? Like, um, Here's something that really frustrates people is that they, you know, Hollywood has all of these movies and increasing number of movies like that one crack, uh, you know, that came out uh, or that was like Netflix or whatever. All movies like this that are portraying all this terrible violence against white people, um, you know, just all this horrific stuff. And this has been increasing in the last few years. Right. Yet, on the other hand, um, if we make something and we we can't we can't do that like we 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 would be swinging above our weight for us to right. turn around and say we're going to do you know that would make people feel better that would kind of harness that energy and it would be in a healthy way because it wouldn't be an act a real act of violence it would be a portrayal of violence you know which does is kind of a catharsis for people right but what i would argue is like we have to be very careful and I will always say right now that White Art Collective is not going to feature anything. And again, I'm not telling people they can't make it, but we're not going to feature anything that portrays violence against uh, identifiable groups of people that are, uh, quote unquote, you know, protected classes in our current paradigm because they people can get in trouble for hate crimes. You literally can get arrested. The other thing I have to think about there is it's, if, even if we don't have the full draconian laws in America yet, uh, it's better than most places. But like, it's bad in Canada. It's bad in the UK. And if I want mm -hmm. people 
to feel comfortable associating with us from those places, which of course I do, because at this point, the White Art Collective needs to function as an international organization, um, then I have to take that into account, that we are not, these people are not afraid to associate with us because of things like that. So these, these are things we have to be very mindful of that. And that's something that really makes people angry is that we can't, like they can do, they can literally attack us. Okay, not only are there films like this, but we're literally being attacked and there's this horrible injustice in the legal system. Mm-hmm. You know, Kyle Rittenhouse was defending himself. Any sensible human being can see that. But, you know, so is James Fields. Um, yeah. Yeah. But it's like, it doesn't matter. Like they have the power and we don't, you know. So yeah. we have to be realistic, Nolis, like you were saying. We have to be, we have to recognize where we are. So... Uh, I, I not, it's my job to protect the organization from just getting attacked or, or getting, you know, accused of whatever this or of, of, uh, promoting hate speech or something like that. So I have to play that game, whether I like it or not. And believe me, it's infuriating. I don't like to be told yeah. Yeah. what I can and cannot say, but yeah. that's where we are. And I, I accept where the, the paradigm that we live in an occupied country and an occupied civilization where we don't have control over our own institutions, legal system, et cetera. So, and we got to deal with that and play it as it lies. You know, I just wanted to add to that. And I, I fully agree. I really, what I'm trying to say here is that through art, we can find creative ways to express these emotions. And that's really what I'm getting at. Um, you know, how we express these emotions, you know, these, it's always up to the individual artists. I mean, I, again, you know, who am I to, uh, uh, prescribe how someone should express their emotions. But what I am saying is that um, be creative in how you do it, right? So, so you understand the circumstances in which we are, understand the environment that we have, understand the rules that we have to play by, at least for the moment. And this is how it is right now. So we have to be creative. We have to be smarter than everyone else. We have to be better than they are. We have to be Quality wise, we have to provide and produce better quality, consistently better quality as we're evolving. So all of these things and and I think a very important part of this balance is also having a strong moral foundation, understanding mm-hmm. our morality. And so that's really another part that we have to also take into consideration. Again, I'm not the one to uh, wag the, you know, the moralizing finger. That's not what I'm talking about. But what I am talking about is in your own value system find the underlying morality of the of and what's your goal why are you doing what you're doing and so i think that understanding all of these things you know we we i would never discourage and i think in in imperium art and i also believe that in 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 the white art collective there's nobody is is discouraging the the full spectrum of the emotion the, the full emotional spectrum i'm just thinking that the way it's expressed has to be done better and it has to be done better than everyone else. And I'm not saying that I'm, I'm, I'm perfect by any stretch of the imagination. I'm just trying to say that we, we should set these goals for ourselves. I, I hope I'm making sense. Yeah, I'd like to say also on behalf of the White Art Collective, we acknowledge and appreciate your strength and leadership, Jeff. I mean, this is really, really above and beyond what most of us can do. And the the level of intelligence and equanimity that you have looking at this extremely profound challenge and having the strength and fortitude to go forward. And, you know, managing a bunch of artists is like herding cats. It's really, really not fun and hard to do. But like the old European explorers, you know, that went out on, on the oceans of the world, there were untold dangers ahead of us and you needed strong a strong captain to kind of lead the ship across these 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 turbulent waters. And that's literally, in a sense, I guess symbolically, I should say that's where we are. We're trying to find the new land, you know, the new world where we can settle our own imperium. We can have our own voice and not be afraid to uh, talk openly about our feelings and, and not be working against a legal system or against the media that portrays us the way that they do, you know. So we're not going to get there without strong leadership, without visionary leadership. And that's you, Jeff Winston. So I do want to say hats off to you, you know, on, 
on behalf of everyone. So also you, one of the topics you were interested in talking about was, uh, I guess, as you, as you phrase it, WAC 2.0. So it sounds like you're, you're, I don't know if we covered that already in some of the earlier discussions. Did you want to expand on that a little bit? Yeah, I, I could say something about that. And and just to tie up the last uh, subject there, I just, I just want to reiterate because it is so important to artists and it's super important to me that I, I would never tell anybody what they can or can't say. I want, you know, and I think at yeah. least if I'm understanding the essence of what Nolis is saying, I want people to fully express themselves you know right. i just i'm a i'm kind of an odd combination of a pragmatist mm. as well as an artist so i'm i try to i'm trying to help shape it in such a way and curation is such an important thing that i've come to really appreciate right. you know like, oh, yeah. it, again it doesn't mean that people can make whatever they want and i'm not going to discourage that at all um but i i have to curate things in such a way and and you know as we grow like more people will have to curate with me um, things in such a way to where we stay on a certain course and that we're staying consistent in the direction we're going, you know, and, and, uh, but yeah, I'm all about creative freedom. We just have to deal with the situation we're in, but anyway, yeah. um, yeah. And, th and that's, th and that will be a continue in WAC 2.0. That will be, uh, something we continue to discuss and refine. And, um, actually, well, one one thing about WAC 2.0, as I talked about a little bit earlier, is I would like to have um, more. Once we get you know kind of more structured, we can bring in more affiliates. And the thing about that is that affiliates will have more freedom. Like if someone, you know, let's let's say like uh, Scum over in the UK, mm -hmm. you know, Lucy mm -hmm. Brown, you know, like mm -hmm. um, that they, they can they have a certain. Um, kind of brand, if you want to call it that they have an yeah. aesthetic, you know, and it's, sure. it's a very complete aesthetic oh, and yeah. it's an edgier feel to it. You know what I mean? And right. I think like that is kind of where the opportunity is going to come in more to, to where like, we're going to be able to take, we'll kind of be like a central hub where people will be able to plug into the pipeline that I was kind of talking about earlier. And then their stuff will be able to go out to affiliates and, you know, my goal is to try to find a place where we can, a sensible place where whatever kind of art you create can be featured, you know, even the, the edgiest stuff, because, you know, I've got stuff that I won't play. I've got my own stuff that doesn't fit in with what I'm saying. You know what <laughs> yeah, I mean? Yeah. Only sure. a handful of people have ever uh, heard it, but it's like, you know, I can't, I can't uh, put that out there because of what we're trying to do with the white art collective as an organization. But I, I also have the urge for that to be, uh, that art to go full, full circle and find its audience, you know, sure. because yeah. I want it to live just like any artist does. But, uh, okay, let me pull up my little thing about WAC 2.0. Oh, hopefully I didn't close it. No. <laughs> um, you've covered a lot already while, while you're looking for it. So, um, this new platform you were talking about, the, um, uh, the positive.media. Yeah, um, yeah, the website. Yeah, so so it's the website. It's uh, whitepositive.media. Those, those two pieces of infrastructure are incredibly mm -hmm. important. Yes. Um, and, and also I talked about the structure of, um, you know, having the different roles of the White Art Collective and then the different levels of those roles. Mm -hmm. And then there's, a, there's some additional roles with artists who are going to, or, or liaisons, like uh, Nolis is going to be our poetry and a literature liaison and we got some folks who are going to be some music liaisons so basically they're going to start you know kind of being the, the corralling the artist so to speak for like a better so, way I, no that that makes damn good sense um, just true. just to interrupt quickly there just for the audience's sake so the website is distinct from the um the white media net Yes, they're they're two separate entities. Those gentlemen, I, I won't uh, take credit for their wonderful work. Yes, whitepositive.media is a separate entity. These a couple of gents who have built that up from scratch, and they are also doing live.whitepositive.media, which will eventually be rebranded as White Live. But uh, nice. so yeah, they they built that. Uh, I I just am jumping on the bandwagon and and doing what we kind of did with uh, White People's Press early on, which was. I see that what these guys are doing is very uh, brilliant, and 
I want to try to do whatever I can to help it continue and mm-hmm. and uh, get the foundation it needs to really take off, you know. Yeah. And so then the you, White Art Collective has its own website that you're also revamping and developing. Yes. Yeah, exactly. We're, we've got a guy working on that. And we're the main element of it's going to have all that structure I was just discussing. And it's going to have, uh, like I said, it'll have the funding element. It'll have Monero integrated into it. It'll have Monero integrated into the store. We'll have the store set up to where it's going to be a lot easier to put stuff on there. Like I also, that's another bottleneck is that there's a number of people who wanted me to put stuff on the store, but it's, it's takes time that I just, I don't have, um, and then also we'll have people being able to like put their writings up on there. We'll have a whole, yeah. you know, people who will have access to the writing part of it. Let me um, interrupt you quickly. I just want to offer sure. myself as the visual arts liaison. So you a can... good. I, I was going to ask you. I was hinting at yeah. it. Yeah. If, if you can, <laughs> if you could just make me like a name tag or something, that'd be great. You know? Yes, my <laughs> name is Donald. Yes, <laughs> I'm the liaison. Yeah, I'm the liaison. Um, actually, kid. for the for the audience again, um, if if you have anything, you know, music, literature, poetry, visual arts, anything that you have, by all means, please uh, send it to Jeff. And then, no, I'm just kidding, Jeff. No, I, please <laughs> send it to Jeff, and I will pawn it off. On, no, I'm just kidding. No, I will. Contact. I will delegate. Yes. <laughs> contact any one of us so if, if it's visual arts please get in touch with donald if right. it's literature poetry and what have you please get in touch with me um you can uh, uh donald I, I guess we could we we should put those emails on the uh um in the description of the uh, video okay. and well, so hey, hey. I think I think the the best way to do it is we'll eventually get it set up to where it'll be automated on the new site. But for now, I think if if they just go ahead and still email contact at White Art Collective, I I mean it, it just takes a minute for me to forward that okay. out to you guys. Okay, okay, yeah. that's that works. <laughs> yeah, and I think it's good too. Look, go ahead and keep me like copied into it as we like start this, oh, so sure. that. First of all, they they emailed that email address. It'd be good if it's in there so they're not confused. And then, um, and that way too, like I can just kind of you know be like, hey, here's kind of how I tend to do this. I've developed kind of a you know kind of a way of that I approach it. You guys are all very affable guys, of course, but it'd be good if we get on the same page of how we're going to okay. um, kind of interact with people and build the rapport and everything. So now again, the audience is experiencing whack in you know whack at work. <laughs> exactly. Right. Whack in motion. Is, behind right. the Whack curtain. Motion. <laughs> Beautiful stuff. Well, I feel like, you know, we're already uh, about an hour and 15 minutes into the show. So maybe we should segue into Imperium art. And before we do that, I think the most important question that we have for you straight out of the gate, and we're not pulling any punches here, Jeff, is Dangdo Durndo Imperium art? <laughs> hey. <laughs> Noah's his wow. question. I'll give him credit. Yes. Okay. Now I'll take it. Then. That's okay. Go for it. I don't. I don't know if it is. You'll have to hear my my uh, my. Tell the, uh, the backstory first, so people know what we're talking about. <laughs> well, Dangdo Durndo is a song that I wrote. Dangdo Durndo is just something my mom would say, like dang this Dangdo cat and that Durndo mouse, or whatever. You know, she just say that, and then uh, I started. Just in my head, I was just like, yeah, dang, no, darn, no. Yeah, that's funny. I kind of made fun of her. And then I heard a little riff, and then I heard a little beat, and then I played it with some friends of mine and made a crappy, you know, very rough recording. Send me the link. Send me the link, yeah. It just became an inside joke with the White Art yeah, Collective. Yeah. And we just, it's just been kind of lingering. But I'm sorry, I didn't, you know, that, that was Nullis's question. got to give him full it's credit. A, it's a great question. And uh, <laughs> we'll okay, get into it more as we get into more of Imperium mm-hmm. Art. So what, what's your take on the Imperium Art project? Give us your overview. Sure. So I've been trying to follow as much of this as I can. I've not, I've probably not been able to listen to an entire of anything or read all of anything, but I'm sure, trying to glean everything. And I mean, you guys have been making a lot of great content. Um, I, I watched most of the Jefferson Davis, Davis, Jefferson Lee. <laughs> Jefferson Lee. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, that's, that's a natural mess up there. But, um, yeah, and um, I think it's, I think it's a very, it's a very valuable conversation to have and i think it's important uh in getting all these different perspectives and understanding what is it what is it that we're doing exactly etc yeah. yeah. i actually i do bristle at the term imperium and i've been this is i've been 
trying to figure out like how do I t- articulate articulate what it is like that I don't like this. Okay, so so the concept, and I know that this lends itself somewhat to the Yaki, which I have not had the opportunity to read the Yaki's um, book and like his concept of Imperium. So, but I, I, me taking it kind of from this, the general definition, the dictionary definition of Imperium, which I think it's important to root these things, of course, and they're the root of the word and the common meaning that most people have. And, you know, Imperiums, it, it means empire in people's minds, but it, in like, it means centralized power, you know? Yes. And, I personally, I bristle at that notion because I kind of think that the way that, that, um, the direction that we're, I think we need to go in, in a sense is the opposite. It's not that we're, we're taking our, our, our own power away, but actually that I want to give cultural power back to people, you know, like it needs to go back to the local level, not, not further away. And l- let me give you an example. I've been thinking about this a lot. Like I've been trying to think of some anecdotes to help drive this home. Right. Mm-hmm. So, okay. So when I was a kid growing up in the eighties, um, there was this whole craze, like this whole surfer craze, you know, there were, there were movies. Um, there was Bill and Ted's of course, that's back in the news with the new one, but, uh, they, there was also fast times at Ridgemont high, with uh what's that dude sean penn and you know uh surf ninjas whatever you know all this was a big thing coming out of and there was the beach boys too like going back to the 60s but like california you know it's obviously on the coast there's a lot of surfers there's a a whole that's a whole culture in and of itself of surfing and things but that's that's like the culture of california right but as a kid growing up in like the heart of the midwest before i'd ever seen the ocean or even been within hundreds of miles of the ocean um uh, like all, it was the trend that, you know, we were all talking like surfers, wearing like rude dog, J- Panama Jack, hang 10, all wearing jams. The entire culture of the West coast was kind of like, kind of, I've, I kind of see it as an affront. It was like put upon us, you know, now it was just, I know that's just kind of how these things work. Look, that's where Hollywood is. They make movies about stuff that they know. You write stories about what you know, right? That's that's yeah. the first rule of writing, yada, yada. And it's close. So if you're going to make a movie, hey, there's the beach. It's right there. But so, I mean, that I've, that's always kind of, I, I've, since then, I've kind of thought about that. It's kind of a fascinating phenomenon. Over the course of my life, the the coast, you know, we talk about the coastal elites, right? Well, there used to be more shows and things that were like kind of middle American. There was even an entire, you know, you had shows like the Beverly Hillbillies. I know this goes back before my time, but there was like Green Acres, Mr. Ed. There's actually a whole sec- section on Wikipedia about all these like kind of rural um, small town shows that that there used to be that all kind of got canceled around the same time. Hee Haw, right? Hee Haw, yeah. Yeehaw, right? I can't even believe that that was like a show on on like primetime television now. That's crazy to think that that was. Mm-hmm. But um, but but so my point is this, right? The culture of the coasts, and and this goes for New York, like a lot of New York films. You know, uh, as a Midwesterner, it's just like oh, it's another film about New York. It's another film about. <laughs> And you know, got a hey, another, hey, yeah, another Woody hey, Allen, all that whole thing, yeah, 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 yeah. Hey, hey, you know, and and yeah, like hey, we Tony, have, hey, Tony, yeah. hey, Tony, hey, my spaghetti, hey, where you been? How's your sister Maria? What's what's the matter with you? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So like, we've had the this culture of the coast, and there used to be Chicago, used to have like there used to be more of a media presence out of Chicago. There is there still is somewhat, but there used to be more bands. There used to be more of a you know like films. There used to be more shows, and just over time too, like that kind of got hollowed out to where everything was like New York and L.A. Yeah, and so I say all this to say that like my entire life, I felt the culture slipping away from the local level and and you know from where i was to where the coast the culture was like somewhere else oh it's cooler somewhere else you know it's cooler over here it's cooler over there and what i've experienced i think is is you know 
probably what a lot of people around the world have experienced with America. You know, they don't usually think oh, yeah. about Americans experiencing that kind of Californication, as yeah, Anthony yeah. Kiedis put it, from the Chili Peppers. But it's it's like, um, you know, you've just had this culture for better and worse, and most of it recently has been worse, uh, put upon you. And so I see that as like, you know, this like centralizing culture has been just the, our ability to affect it has been taken further and further away. So I don't like the idea of further centralized power structure of culture, like uh, out of people's own hands, you know, out further away from their, their local levels. And, and here's something else to think about. So I've, I've noticed, and this kind of goes to the whack audience thing that we were almost going to touch on a minute ago, but it actually fits here better, better. So when, when I think when our Saturday night live stream, where we played, uh, it was our last 4th of July, uh, just back over the summer where we played all American artists. And we've almost never done that because I'm always trying to like get artists. We, we are inherently like an international organization, so, but I, I was trying to get, you know, I want to get, so I want to get artists from all over the place involved. So it's kind of hard at this level to be when we only have, you know, a handful of shows, I don't want to like exclude people, but we just, you know, it was 4th of July. It made sense to have an all American artist show. And we had a bigger viewership. We, we could debate whether maybe there were some other factors on that. It was significantly larger viewership than we normally had. And I'd had, a number of people ask me before, like, hey, why don't you do like a, an American themed show, etc. Right. Um, but I, I think it's because and it just in general, right, that people, they I mean, overwhelmingly, you know, in these spheres and the people we talk to, like they're nationalists for their country. Mm -hmm. So culture, you know, the, the culture that they really are seeking is is culture that is really rich with with their identity uh with their nationality you know so what we do is i think a little bit confusing to them we have to do it with where we're at right now and i love it because we get to meet artists from all over the world you know we've got french swedish hungarian um I think we got Croatian, we've, you know, of course, America, UK, Australia, Canada. I don't think we have any South African yet, some German. Um, anyway, anyway, like that's awesome. But at yeah. the same time, I, I think what direction and the reason I, I'm saying this about Imperium is like, I don't want to do that in order to try to create a centralized culture that we're then going to try to, you know, and I, there is a commonality there. Like, I'm not saying there's not some pieces of art you could create at that high level that wouldn't resonate. But for me personally, and with that anecdote, what I was saying, it was like, I've always thought that the richest culture is more local, you know, like I want to just be an American mm -hmm. and I want to be a mid, I want to be able to be a Midwesterner, you know, like, mm -hmm. I don't want to have to think about the coast. I want to be back to where my life and my culture is right in front of me and I'm living it right there and I can affect it. And I hear, you know, I hear music that's representative of me. I can see shows that are representative of me and my people immediately around me, you know? And I think that what I want to do is to give, I, I my suspicion is that that's how, many of our folk feel where, wherever they are, right. They don't want their, the culture to be further away from them. They want it more back in their hands. And then that culture being distributed back into the hands of our folk, uh, the, the politics will follow it, you know, and the economic will follow that as well to where they will have their sovereignty back. So that's why I, I don't, I don't want to be a white globalist, you know, I'm a nationalist. Um, you know, mm. I want I wanted to address this because I think that I, I, I come from a very unique position of having sort of both feet or one foot in each continent, so to speak. And so I'm very familiar with the European uh, cultural milieu. I'm also familiar with the American cultural milieu, at least in my particular 
region of the United States. Um, and so I address this very specifically because I'm very uh, sensitive to this question in terms of, you know, the national identity, the local regional identity. And I think that um, we have to, bal again, it's a question of balance, right? We have to understand that the geopolitical developments, the geocultural developments, it's not just glo globalism versus regionalism. It's also um, civilizational uh, clashes that are are evolving. So you'll have, you know, the the Chinese presence in 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 Asia, very strong monolithic presence, and they think of themselves in terms of a they have a civilizational destiny. Um, the Indians also in India and in the Indian subcontinent have. A, an evolving civilizational sense of civilizational destiny. And so us as, as let's just say, the European diaspora, we have to also embrace the civilizational destiny. That's not to say, of course, that we want to um, uh, create a culture above the component cultures, but we have to understand ourselves within this uh, broader context of the European man and, and by understanding ourselves within this broader context of the European man, that's where at least I believe we see the Imperium. And so if you don't mind, I just want to read a, a little bit of my essay, because I think that this speaks specifically to what you're talking about, Jeff. And so this is the section called the collaboration of the continuum through the Imperium. So Imperium must be understood as a plane of artistic consciousness that encompasses every element of the underlying foundation of organic nationalism. The European ethnos represents the bonds of unity and convergence. The European mythos is the wellspring from which the art draws inspiration. And the European logos is the only way in which Imperium art is expressed. These sources are understood through the component national cultures that have made Europe and the Europeans the most successful civilization in human history. Above these components lies the realization of unity through the Imperium, where Europeans can enrich each other with their respective organic identities. Imperium art creates awareness where Europeans find common solidarity through the Imperium and attempts to bridge a gap among the various interpretations of European identity. In parentheses, this also naturally includes the, the Americas, Australia, and New Zealand, so on, and South Africa, and so on and so forth. Um, even in South America, by the way, let's, you know, we should embrace that as well. Um, suffice it, um, just let me continue. Imperium art is not to be conflated with the concept of empire in the political context. Instead, it creates an existential location of cultural convergence, where all our respective traditions are equally celebrated, cherished, and respected. Visually, Imperium art is best represented by the Norse berserker fighting along the Teutonic Knight, the Celtic warrior fighting alongside the Roman legionnaire, the Hussite soldier fighting alongside the crusader, or the Magyar horse archer fighting alongside the German man-at-arms, and so on. Imperium art is not a big tent movement, nor should it impose a myopic view on the understanding of European identity. Cultural and ideological associations, as well as historic contexts, are often not only divergent, but carry a long list of mutual grievances and even animosity among members of the European family. This is a reality one cannot simply sweep under the rug for the sake of imposing a new identity, for it will, <clears throat> for it will inevitably create the opposite reaction and defeat the purpose of Imperium art. Instead, an open and honest dialogue based on mutual respect must prevail within the ex existential realm. While some of these differences may never find resolution, the immediate collective threat posed by globalist elites and ongoing streams of migrant invasions must encourage all to understand the need to defend the greater good of European and white well-being all over the world. So I, I wanted to make a point of this because I think that you're absolutely right, Jeff, and I think that a lot of people have these fears of losing their own individual identity within some greater imperial context. Um, I think that we 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 need to embrace common symbolism, like Donald always talks about. I think that we need a common logos, if you will. We need a common mythos. So we need all of these things. But at the same time, we want to stay, you know, who we are, and we want to be 
uh, grounded in the in the you know in the soil from which we sprung. So I think I think this is this is really what my perception, at least, of the Imperium is. May I respond as well? So I'm very very. Oh, I don't know. If you'd like to respond to Nellis, Jeff? Yeah, if I could. Uh, oh, before God. I forget. Um, of course. Yeah, I I don't I don't necessarily I agree that we of course we have to think of it civilizationally and of course obviously a lot of us do which is you know I, I remember one of the first things that really red pilled me back in 2015 was it like the mass sexual assaults in Cologne Germany on New Year's Eve I think it was 2015 and yeah. um, I, I was just like whoa you know even though I didn't at the time feel terribly connected to Germany I do have a little German lineage, you know, but it's it's just like Germany is Germany. Like you, I took German in high school, you know, I also took Latin, I, I took French in college, you know, it's like um, you kind of take it all for granted, but you are part of this broader civilization, even though you don't realize it. But I, I felt like, I was like, I felt this kind of inherent sense, like we had been invaded, you know, like this isn't these out, this right. outside group. And I think that was around that time was, you know, around the time a number of people were starting to get that sense with the migrant crisis quote unquote it was an invasion intentionally just tearing down the gates but my point being that i agree with you that uh you know we we need to have this civil civilizational sense and i think that you know a fair amount of people do i think what i'm trying to get at is that you know what like some of this is just too abstract for average people who I think are just more inherently nationalist in the way they're going to be able to understand the world. Like, so we kind of have to all meet in the grand hall, so to speak, the people who are the pattern noticers, people who have higher capacities to understand these incredibly gargantuan concepts and zoom all the way out and look at Western civilization as this, you know, this one entity and understand it that way. And I think that, what I'm trying to say is like, we have to take that, take the essence of what Western civilization means and like translate it back to uh -huh. our respective, you know, countries. Uh, so like, you know, cause like as an American, um, you know, like I can do that. I, I can, I can capture the essence of what it is to be part of Western civilization of this great, you know, but going back to the Greco Roman and before that and, and after that, of course, and, and all these incredible things. And then, but I can also, no one com can communicate to Americans and even, you know, even more specifically to Midwesterners the way that I can and make it rich for them to where they, it has all of that, those nutrients in it that something created by someone from another country, white weather, Western civilization, you know, they couldn't communicate to them on that level, you know. So mm -hmm. that's that's kind of what I'm kind of what I'm trying to get at. And one of the things in your essay that I liked was you were you would you didn't like that people were talk, saying petty nationalism. I don't like that term. I either. don't like that term. <laughs> no, it's terrible. It, it's 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 inherently condescending and insulting to the nation. And of course, in the way that I think we all understand it, the nation being that particular group of people. Oh, petty national. You're just saying this group of people is petty for being inherently connected to each other, but that's just that's just how they naturally are. That's how things naturally de developed. Well, that but that's it, the organic nationalism, really. If you want yeah, to put it. yeah, exactly. So, so what I'm saying is, um, um, I, I guess where I just differ slightly in the way I'm thinking of it is just that I don't. Okay, well, let's quickly. Or, uh, Donald, you had made some, um, like something you're like, is this Imperium art, you know, and I can't remember which painting it was. And there mm -hmm. was, there were like a lot of combinations of like symbols from the various, um, uh, you know, countries, uh, mm -hmm. cultures of Europe yeah. and things. Yeah. You maybe yeah. know the one I'm talking about. Yeah. I know you've done a, a couple, I think, and you're, you're kind of like correct. Imperium art paintings. Correct. And I was looking at, at it and I, to me, you know, I, I was thinking, I was like, I don't know, like, I get it, right? And I know what you're doing, but I wonder if, like, like the average American or the average Swede or, you know, the average German or whoever, like, uh, to them, does that just look like 
gobbledygook, you know, like why are all those symbols combining together? And I'm not saying that they're not capable of understanding civilization at all, like as a broader concept, but like in symbols and such, um, you know, like, I don't, I don't know if that, that would, it would really translates. Cause I, I've been saying this for a while that like a movie for everybody is a movie for nobody, you know, or a right. movie for, you know, and I speak of that usually in terms of like Hollywood shoehorns in a Chinese character so they can try to reach the Chinese audience, et cetera, you know? And I guess, you know, I'm, I kind of thinking, I'm thinking, obviously you're not doing it for those, those reasons, but it's just like, you know, are we, are we trying to do that if if we're trying to create something like that, where we're trying to, you know, put together all of the different uh, symbols and things? And th- there are some ways in which it might work. There's like uh, Gingerzilla has that uh, all those mm-hmm. different. He's got like the Crusader. He's got like yeah. the American sure. Revolutionary and sure. the Viking. And, you right. know, right. maybe that there in that instance, it's distinct. Right. It's mm-hmm. like these are distinct characters from distinct eras. Um but yeah, that I guess that's the thing is like, is I think it just has to be translated back to into a more nationalistic thing from people who can grasp that highest level um, abstraction. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I wanted to. I, I that's that you made a really good point, Jeff, about being able to translate it back to your people, so to speak, if you want to put it in those terms. So, so to your. Um, your your organic ethnos, so to speak. So so for example, um, <clears throat> what I believe, at least, the Imperium serves the purpose in this particular case as a meeting place, where we enter into the Imperium as representatives, as ambassadors, cultural ambassadors, so to speak, of our respective back cultures, of our respective nations, and we congregate in the Imperium, learn from each other, inspire each other. We grow together. But your good point is that we still have to step out of the Imperium back into our locus, and we have to translate all this experience back to our people to give them the motivation to understand the greater Imperium, if that makes sense. I have quite a lot to say, (laughs) if I may. (laughs) Um, I'm, first of all, extremely moved by everything Jeff is saying regarding Imperium art. And I honestly think he's actually answering a lot of his own questions in some ways. And no less, your response to all of it is is perfect. We've been, uh, this whole show is an investigation as well as a documentation. And that's why we invite everybody on the show within our sphere to say, what are your thoughts on this? And then, you know, what you've done, Jeff, is you've just lit a much larger candle and and spread even more light within the darkness to see the parameters of what Imperium art is. Um, I think that your, your sensibility of this kind of like, I don't want to merge into this glo- white globalism collective, mm-hmm. so to speak, where I, I lose my identity. That That's not at all what it is. And Nullis just explained that. I was thinking of kind of like, you know, a, a player on a team. You know, I mean, this is a very uh, shallow analogy, but the idea being that everyone in the Imperium art sphere, if you will, we're all bound or bonded together by our shared suffering of our awareness of white genocide that is the cornerstone and and there's very many many uh manifestations of that in culture law history uh, censorship that we could we've been talking about it right so but it all goes back to the to this this force that we're fighting against that's trying to destroy us and so I think one of the key critical uh, kind of where the two tectonic plates meet is the question of, you know, indigenous, um, let's say indigenous ethnic or nationalist art versus Imperium art. So if you make some kind of artwork that people in the Midwest would all identify with and, and relate to and enjoy is like, yeah, that's our, our Midwestern culture. We relate to that. We get it but it did not somehow plug into the white positive sphere, the dissident right, the alt-right. And and in some sense, uh, either through intent or context or content, 
reflect that understanding, then you know, this is this is a discussion. Is, is indigenous European art Imperium art, or is it just imper- indigenous art? So we haven't fully like fleshed out these questions and found answers to them. And I think it's okay. I'm, a, I'm like, it's not a problem in the sense that it's exciting and it's us figuring out ourselves, but it's, it's an oddball situation to be in because we're being subjectively objective <laughs> about it, you know, an artist within a movement trying to map out and say, what is the movement? It's, it's really more of a, almost an academic uh, project uh, the, or, or in some ways a historic look, but it's we're in history right now. And so it's very hard to, to, to really outline those things. So that's the abstraction that you don't like, you know, and I think that, that gets, it gets less and less abstract with each show that we do. Um, if, you know, I, I could go to the bookstore and pick up a magazine on say Western painting, you know, just pastoral cowboys and, and horses on the Midwest plains and, and they're beautiful. Right. And they, something about the American national spirit in it, for example. But, you know, if I contacted the artist and I said, oh, well, what do you think about, you know, white, white replacement strategies? Mm-hmm. And they might hang up the phone on me. You know, oh, I can't, you know, you see what I'm saying? So how would they, they're not plugged into the, the, the real jet fuel that, that is, is pushing this movement forward. That w- would there even be a white art collective if nobody was aware of or stood up for uh, white well-being? You see what I'm saying? So it's it's tricky. It's a little bit difficult in the sense that we're stepping up to the plate. OK, let's say the white art collective is stepping up to the plate and saying, yes, we're going to represent white interests, white identity politics. And you you, you had the gumption and the moxie to do that. You meaning everybody in the collective. Well, we're kind of stepping forward and stepping up to the plate and taking the narrative, the historic and academic narrative and saying Imperium art. And, you know, I guess you know, we've tried to defend it all along, but at the same time, we also invite challenge. We, we invite critique. And, and I have to say, maybe, maybe it's not the right terminology. I, I think that it's a good starting point and that the artists of this movement really should be the, the authors of that. But if nobody starts a dialectic about the, you know, the art movement of the dissident right, then we don't have any conversation at all. So that's pretty much, I'm, I'm kind of, you know, sort of like taking the ship out of the dock, you know, and then getting everybody on board to, to do their roles and, and have some uh, input on the direction that we go in. Does, does that make any sense? Yeah, absolutely. And I commend you for that. Like I the, I think I started out I was saying I think it's really uh, valuable to have this conversation regardless of how things might, you know, uh, evolve or whatever. It has to start somewhere. And so I have the utmost respect for what you guys are doing <clears throat> in in having this conversation. And th- the thing is too that we are, you know, more self-aware than we've ever been. Mm-hmm. So well so it's like it does make sense that you kind of you kind of write the history as you do it. And mm. I feel like this is also a uh, <coughs> sorry, dry spot, a a strategic, you know, kind of thing too, to to mm-hmm. just like I, I was saying, you know, kind of how I'm framing that and thinking of it is very much like I'm also working out as as I put as a question earlier, is like who is our audience? Um, because I think that's something with the white art collective, we're still figuring out. Um, I think we've, we've done a good job of, of, uh, bringing in artists. Like we put up a flag and we brought in a lot of artists. And I think we're at a point in white art collect or WAC 2.0 where we need to bring in more of the people to see the art. You know what I mean? So we need Mm -hmm. to figure out how we, how we flip that to get them in. But back to the point about Imperium art just in general is, Exactly. Like you just have to start the conversation and, and like that is, it's a kind of an art, right? As artists, we experiment, you, you, you step out and you try something and, and you put those words together and you put those colors together, you put those symbols together and 
you don't know, you know, you, you shape it and yeah. uh, that might be the verbiage. You know what I mean? Maybe mm-hmm. I'm, maybe my mind is going to be changed. I'm certainly open to it. And, but I mean, this is a, a fascinating and important uh, conversation that yeah. I wouldn't have, like I've been, I've waited this long to come on here because <laughs> I really wanted to, I kind of wanted to hear what everybody else was going to say, but I also needed to like formulate my thoughts around sure. these, these concepts. Yeah. It and needed to grow for a while. It needed to gestate, you know? Exactly. And if, if you guys weren't doing this, I might not have, you know, formed these particular thoughts and, and, and yeah. had a reason to, um, to articulate them. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? So it's like, it's important that these this exist for that very reason, so that so that we can better articulate what mm-hmm. it is. What are we doing? You know, we mm-hmm. are we're figuring we're trying to figure that out, right? <laughs> well, I, I mean, I I think I can certainly say that I am for white globalism in the sense that it uh, an awakening across the entire European diaspora to recognize our common roots, our common history, our common destiny, uh, our accomplishments, all of it. And the deeper you go into finding out who you are, finding out who stole your history from you and how they're trying to destroy you, all of these things are a a very gradual and extremely powerful awakening. And that's literally what our arts are our arts are doing we're waking people up whether you know i mean if you're just doing it for yourself but you put it out there however many people see it they new synapses are are kind of forming in their brain like oh my god i'm 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 part of this greater culture this greater history and this greater destiny and how do i i want more i want to know more i want to become who i am so um uh, that never means that you lose your national identity or your ethnic identity, never. And so I, I think we can drop that. I think we can let that go, that, you know, your your ethnic identity, national identity is just the the sort of the, 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 the voice or the portal through which all of this bio spirit expresses itself. And so, you know, that's kind of what we're, we're doing. So I, I'm sure that we can all have disagreements about politics and and you know various other types of things we we white people have a lot of disagreements <laughs> about various things um but that's that's healthy just so long as we recognize our our brotherhood and the essence of our spirit and our destiny and take control of that and that's pretty much what the arts really is about in some way i mean you can well donald that was <laughs> that was what uh in one of the conversations with the wind episode when i had uh the uh croatian and polish uh guests up on where yeah. we had that wonderful conversation about how basically you know we're like cousins or brothers and we're always bickering but you know if somebody's coming from the outside trying to uh attack one of us then you know we close ranks and we stick together mm-hmm. and i think that that you know we can look at it that way as well uh, among others although i would prefer that we focus less on the bickering and more sure. on the uh, cooperation but right. um, hopefully that that is going to gradually evolve by itself i think that reasonable voices and and more um, you know, wise approaches are probably going to uh, trump uh, um, any other approach. Hopefully. Yeah, I, I feel that the more uh, divisive we are among ourselves, the more we're allowing our enemies to win. We must have that sense of civilizational struggle, civilizational uh, destiny. We must have that. And, and that can't happen until we all wake up and recognize our common core, our common destiny, our DNA, if you will, our spiritual DNA, and maybe in some sense. So that's really, I think, what the the idea behind Imperium art as a title is is about. And it, it's much more than that. There's a lot more that we'll discuss and ex, you know, explore throughout these uh, these episodes. So Jeff, I wanted to give you a chance to respond to that a little bit. Um, yeah, I mean, at, at the end of the day, I think, uh, 
yeah, we, I mean, I I only just kind of disagree as of in our conversation here just slightly about framing, but ultimately uh, we're mm-hmm. overwhelmingly on the same page, of yeah. course, and we have the same end goal in mind, which is of yeah. course preservation of our folk, preservation of our nationalities, our mm-hmm. our distinct diversity of our different cultures. Yeah. And um and just to inspire our people uh, to live again, you know, we've kind of been yeah. in this funk and kind of been uh, down, you know, I think part of this is kind of, we've been in a natural kind of down cycle and I right. feel that we're going to get on the way back up, but, yeah. Uh, but yeah. And also just one more note there that, uh, yeah, I'm all for the, of course, like the, the, the global awakening I just, again, just the framing, like I wouldn't call it globalism just because that's kind of one of those, that's one of those trigger points. There you go. That's like another, (laughs) it's just out there. So like, you know, I'll leave it to you to come up with a better term then. Oh, see, no, I didn't say I was going to come up some better. I'm just one of those guys that comes in with my hot takes and I, I deconstruct what you do. People do this to me all the time. I'm like, well, help me. <laughs> you know, there's so much of that out there. It's 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 rough. I'm I always try to encourage people to you know have solutions. It's fine to criticize, break down things, but please come with some solutions. You know. Yeah, anyway, I, I, I I don't have a solution. You guys are doing great work, so I can't. I don't know. Yeah, I don't, I, I don't have it yet. <laughs> well, I, that's I all been well. I mean, I'm sure with all that uh, uh, extra free time you have, you can probably think of something. No. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll yeah. be working on. It. <laughs> well, again, I just so we're we're running on about two hours here. This has been an extraordinary show. I just cannot really thank you enough, and I don't think anyone in our in the dissident right, the white positive sp- sphere, can thank you enough for everything that you've done. You've laid great foundations, and I have to say, I'm really, really honored to know you, and and I'm very happy to be uh, a, a white pillar in this community. And and then I, I turn and I speak to the audience very, very seriously and sincerely. You are not a passive listener. You are not. You if you're hearing this, you're part of this, and you must do something as well. And whatever that is, it's up to you. You know your skill sets. You know your strengths. The very least, you should be promoting all this content among your networks and getting our numbers up higher and higher. This, you know, it's you've been doing this two years, Jeff. Where are we going to be in two more years? Let's keep our, our eye on that. And four years and eight years, we the, the almost future three is, years actually, almost, almost three years. years. Well, there you go. Yeah, so yeah. the future is ours. Take it. So Nullis, would you any any last uh, dango dirndos from you over there? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, I just wanted to say thank you, Jeff. This was an honor to have you on this uh, on this Imperium Art project. And um, where WAC will be, where the White Art Collective will be in two years, I think that uh, we're going to rule everywhere. Mm-hmm. That's where I want to. That's see. right. We're going <laughs> to rule the world like Bill and Ted style. We're going <laughs> to. We're gonna, <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna create the the art that saves our folk and exactly uh, yeah we're gonna inspire and yeah I, I'm very optimistic about where things are going. Thank you guys so much for having me on. It's an absolute pleasure and uh, you know it's it's taken my thinking in new and different ways and uh, that's great. That's very valuable. Let's keep the discussion going and I'm happy to come back and you know check back in and in, uh, in a, a little bit. You're I, welcome I anytime. We, yeah. Yeah, we we really need to check back with you every once in a while. I think that would be an important thing, being who you are in in this movement. Um, so just a quick reminder: this uh, Friday is it or Saturday? Friday is the uh, White Art Collective D Live Karaoke Show in uh, October 25th at 8 p.m. Sunday. Uh, Nullis's Conversations with the Wind starts season two. Uh, that uh, Friday, prior to that, October 25th, is the Spooky Short Film Festival with the White Art Collective. Please uh, go ahead and check out the links below, share and comment, and thank you so much for joining us, everyone. Have a wonderful day or evening. Bye-bye. Bye.